It's pretty hard to take exception to Mini's third-generation convertible model. Larger and slightly more practical than before, it's also more efficient and media-savvy. Best of all, the stiffer chassis now makes it much better to drive. As a result, it's far more the kind of car that every Mini should be, and not before time. Convertible is a key part of the Mini lineup. It's always offered just the right blend of retro charm mixed in with the appeal of a good looking and fully retractable fabric roof that previously has rather restricted this car's day to day practicality. With this improved third generation convertible range, the brand aims to address that issue at the same time as developing this model's premium feel. So familiar are we with the idea of open-topped mini motoring that it's almost a surprise to discover that this variant is primarily an invention of BMW rather than the British motor industry. Yes, there were drop-top variants of the original Alec Kisagonis design, but these were largely the work of specialist coach builders. Only in the final years of the early version did Rover commission a short production run of mini convertibles, and even then, only 300 were sold. BMW had no such reticence when it came to the idea of a cabrio model and shortly after the new generation mini models launch at the turn of the century, the first proper convertible version joined the range in 2004. This car, known as the R52 series model in mini circles, proved hugely successful, quickly accounting for over 20% of all mini sales, with over 164,000 examples sold over a production run that lasted until 2009. The R57 series Mark II design that replaced it was equally well received, stiffer, faster and more sophisticated than its predecessor. But by 2015, it was beginning to struggle against new arrivals like the DS3 Cabrio and Volkswagen's second generation Beetle Cabriolet. Hence the need for the Mark III model F57 generation mini convertible that we're going to try here. Like the previous two versions, it's based on its hatchback sister, which means it's had to grow slightly in size. No bad thing, given the need for greater rear seat and boot space. The electric fabric hood's more sophisticated too, as are the engines and the degree of media connectivity. And there are also some fashion-orientated options that might bring a smile to your face. Sounds promising, doesn't it? Let's put this car to the test. One of the key aims when designing this car was to offer the fun of top-down motoring without sacrificing too much in terms of space and driving dynamics. Uh, the second generation Mini Convertible tried hard in this respect, but even its greatest fans couldn't pretend that the driving experience completely replicated the go-kart-like handling of the fixed-top version. As to why, uh, well, uh, imagine a shoebox with the lid on it. Now it's quite rigid until you pop the top off, whereupon it becomes suddenly quite a wobbly thing. And the same applies to convertible cars when their roofs are removed, which is why so much effort goes into remedial reinforcement work to try and rectify the problem. And for the Mark III model version of this Mini, believe me, they put a lot of work into it. For a start, it gets the brand new UK L1 platform developed for the third generation Mini hatch and smaller BMWs, a sound basis for development further enhanced with a stiffening plate under the engine, uh, also with Meteor A pillars and braces that create a diamond shape beneath the car. As a result of all this, the German engineers have managed to create standards of torsional rigidity that replicate rival compromise convertibles, contenders like Fiat's 500C and the DS3 Cabrio that aren't full drop tops and try and get around that rigidity issue by merely providing what amounts to a giant retracting fabric sunroof. You'll appreciate Mini's efforts fairly early on in your test drive, particularly if you've experienced one of the previous generation versions of this car. That more thorough bracing has very effectively eradicated most of the juddering that you get over bumps with the roof down in so many open top models. Uh, industry analysts call it scuttle shake. Now that's an issue you don't tend to notice so much on larger, more expensive convertibles because of their heavier metalwork. That many have sorted it without adding in that kind of extra weight is impressive. 
For reference, this car weighs in at under 1.3 tonnes, just 90 kilograms more than its ordinary fixed top stablemate. All this helps the ride as well, an area in which this model starts off with an advantage thanks to its use of a sophisticated multi-link rear axle. Most other convertibles in this class use a simpler torsion beam setup. Now you don't appreciate the effect of that quite so much on high performance versions, but on mainstream variants the suspension really does a very good job indeed of soaking up almost everything that can be thrown at it. A few smaller cracks in the road can be felt now and again, but larger potholes and ridges are now smoothed over with impressive ease. Extra cost variable damper control can further improve things in this regard. Its settings activated by another option, the mini driving mode system operated by this selector at the base of the gear lever. This offers the choice of a normal mid setting, an eco-conscious green mode or a sport option that sharpens the throttle and the steering reactions when the road opens up. And when that does happen, you'll want the characteristic mini perkiness to be in evidence. And broadly, it is. Much of that is due to the steering, which is very direct and lets the car dart into corners in a way that might take a little getting used to if you're not especially mini-minded. Once you've adjusted, though, we reckon you'll like the injection of sportiness you get, even when you're just nipping down to the shops. Now, if that is all you're going to be doing most of the time in this car, then don't bother forking out for the variant that we're trying here, the flagship 231 brake horsepower John Cooper Works performance model with its firmer feel, 6.6 second 0 to 62 miles per hour acceleration and 150 miles per hour top speed. Instead, you're more likely to be amongst the vast majority of mini convertible buyers who will be trying this car with one of the BMW Group's latest downsized three-cylinder 1.5-litre engines plumbed in beneath the bonnet. There are two of these twin-power turbo power plants, the 136 brake horsepower petrol unit fitted to the affordable Cooper model and a 116 brake horsepower diesel found in its more economic Cooper D counterpart. As you might expect, the diesel offers more pulling power, but for us, it's the petrol-powered Cooper that represents the sweet spot in the range. Its basic performance stats rest to 62 miles an hour in 8.8 .8 seconds en route to 129 miles an hour, make it over a second and nearly 10 miles an hour faster than the Cooper D, but that's not really why we prefer it. No, the appeal lies with lag-free pulling power that gives you everything that unit has from low down in the rev range and a distinctive engine note that's very easy on the ear and encourages you to rev hard just to listen to the offbeat noise. Just as much of a pleasure to use is the six-speed manual gearbox, though you do have to be careful when selecting first gear not to pop it into reverse by mistake. The alternative uh, to that is the Steptronic six-speed automatic that we're trying here with its steering wheel mounted change paddles. Go for one of the faster two litre petrol turbo models and you can have a quicker shifting sport version of this Autobots complete with launch control to fire you off the line. It's optional on the 192 brake horsepower Cooper S and standard on this 231 brake horsepower John Cooper Works flagship variant. Uh, get it fitted and 62 miles an hour is achievable a fraction quicker, which means just above or just below 7 seconds, depending on the version you choose. Top speed in the Cooper S is 142 miles an hour. Now with this sort of grunt being directed through the front wheels, you might think this Mini would scrabble for traction in tighter corners or when pulling out of junctions, but it doesn't. To some extent, this is down to the so-called performance control torque vectoring system that's standard on these two-litre models and optional on the lesser variants. Uh, this manages torque delivery through the front wheels, uh, prioritizing power to the wheel with the most traction, and so aiding quicker forward momentum. A harder issue for Mini's development team to solve was that of maneuverability in urban driving. When the roof's down like this, the folded fabric massively obscures your view rearwards, hence the need for the brand to fit rear parking sensors and a rear view camera as standard on all models. Now that helps hugely when you're trying to park, but it doesn't solve the problem of restricted rear vision when you're trying to change lanes at cruising speeds. When the roof's up, low speed manoeuvring is a touch easier and a little simpler than it was on the previous generation model, thanks to the provision this time around of a slightly larger rear window. 
Of course, a vital part of this Minis charm is letting the wind tug at your hair, but that would quickly become wearing if the experience was too blustery. Fortunately, it needn't be. When the roof's down like this and the side windows are up and the optional wind deflector is clicked into place above the back seats, the cabin's sheltered enough for comfortable touring on major roads. Don't get us wrong, it's not as serene in here as it would be in a larger cabrio, and you certainly wouldn't leave this Mini's roof down for hours at a time on the motorway. But for most trips you'll make, the compromise achieved here is a very acceptable one. You'll probably want to do as much of your driving as possible in al fresco mode. Uh, there's even a rather pointless optional always open timer to record how long the roof's been down. But of course, in our climate, it's only a matter of time before the rain sets in. Uh, that's something you can be warned about via the clever Rain Warner app that's standard on most models. Uh, this knows your location and monitors the weather, beaming an alert to your phone so that uh, if you're across the road sipping on a cappuccino, you can nip over and climate proof the cabin. If you're on the move, the app will even suggest safe places where you can stop and put up the roof. Not that you necessarily need to stop to do that. As you can see, the Fabric Top's electric mechanism will activate on the move at speeds of up to 18 miles an hour. With the soft top raised, this Mini is very well insulated from the hubbub of the outside world. Uh, where some cars with a canvas roof become uncomfortably loud at higher speeds, here occupants can carry on a conversation without having to shout. In changeable weather, there's an alternative to full retraction of the roof, thanks to a feature uh, that allows you to open the front section of the fabric by 40 centimetres, so it works more like a sunroof, or like the kind of top you get on the rival 500C and DS3 Cabrio models I mentioned earlier. This is ideal for driving at motorway pace or when the weather's a little too chilly to go fully open. So, what do you think? The look and feel may not be dramatically different with this third generation mini convertible, but it still carries a cute, compact and quite upmarket demeanor, especially when optioned up like this top variant is. Get out the tape measure and you'll find that in Mark III model form, the car's longer, wider and just fractionally taller than its predecessor, but the differences are subtle as is the design execution of the electric fabric folding roof. We'll start with that since it's of course the primary reason you'll be buying this car. If you want open air motoring in a Mini, uh, choosing this convertible version is the only way you're going to get it. The brand offered the alternative of a lower slung Roadster variant during the previous model generation, but that car has long since been deleted and it won't be replaced. So what about this fabric top? Well, the first thing to point out is that it's a proper fully fledged convertible hood rather than the kind of giant fabric sunroof you get with so-called convertible rivals like the Fiat 500C, the DS3 Cabrio and the Vauxhall Adam Rocks Air. There are pluses and minuses to that approach, of course. You can see an obvious downside right here in the way that the folded roof blocks your view rearwards when the top's down. Now, as standard across the range, Mini fits rear parking sensors and a rear view camera to compensate, but it's still something you'll have to get used to when you're manoeuvring. That apart, there aren't too many issues with this hood. Hold this button on the header rail and it goes up or down in just 18 seconds, and it can be operated at speeds of up to 18 miles an hour. When the hood's in place, you can slide back the front section to reveal a 40 centimetre long opening that's very much like a sunroof. Now, as I just mentioned, in a rival 500C or DS3 Cabrio, you wouldn't be able to do much more than that. But with this Mini, the top then can go all the way back for a feel that leaves you much more at one with the element. Mini offers a handy Rain Warner app that sends a notification to your mobile phone, prompting you to raise the roof if the forecast threatens rain. It also lets you know if there's a risk of a shower as you drive and suggests places to pull in to change back to an enclosed cabin. Uh, rather more pointless in our view is the optional always open timer that records how long you've driven on each journey with the roof down. 
On to the overall style of this car. Now with the hood up, the convertible maintains its fashionable feel, although the broad rear quarters of this canopy may to some look a touch heavy handed. As you expect, there's a glass rear screen to help with insulation and security. And the reason the folded hood can't be better hidden away becomes pretty apparent back here. <laughs> there isn't a lot of bodywork behind the rear wheels, but that's what gives this uh, car its classic mini proportions. Large rear lights are set right to the outer edges of the bodywork with the bumper curving up to meet them. And lower down, these centrally positioned chrome tipped twin tailpipes add a sporty touch, integrated into a diffuser style black mesh trim panel flanked by fog lights on either side. Move to the front and it's certainly all reassuringly familiar, or at least it will be if you're already well acquainted with the third generation mini hatch. The large headlights feature chrome rings, while the power dome in the middle of the bonnet is standard, even on lesser variants than this one, adding in a little muscle to the equation. The large clamshell bonnet gives the front end a clean cut style, flowing into a typically upright mini windscreen. The main grille has a chrome surround, and beneath it is another opening with mesh featuring a honeycomb, or as in this case, a hexagonal finish. Uh, this can be flanked by fog lights that sit at the outer edges of the bumper and can feature optional LED illumination. Uh, we'll finish outside with a look at this car in profile, a perspective from which owners of the previous Mark II model may well notice this newer design's substantial 98 millimeters of extra length. Now that's been made possible by this third generation version's adoption of BMW's more sophisticated UK L1 platform, underpinnings that have significantly strengthened the architecture's torsional rigidity. That additional length is emphasized by this black lower sill molding that continues around these prominent wheel arches and on into the bumpers. Inside those arches are wheels that can be 16, 17, or as in this case, 18 inches in size. And you get these neat side indicator units below the windscreen pillar on the front wings. And as a finishing touch, a thin chrome strip runs around the waistline point at which the metal body meets the hood. Time to thunk that long door shut and get behind the wheel. Settle into the firm but supportive cushioning of the driver's seat. And the first thing that might be apparent is how low you're sat in the car. If you come to this third generation model from an older mini convertible, your next impression might well be to appreciate your more spacious surroundings. The extra height, uh, width and length of this car really tells from this perspective in additional levels of head, leg and shoulder room that give this version uh, much more of a grown up feel than previous models could offer. More room means extra flexibility when it comes to driving position adjustment. You can, for example, now push your chair back a little more and do so without necessarily cutting a rear seat occupant off of the knees. Plus, everything is backed up by standards of fit and finish that are unsurpassed in this class and much better than you get from, say, a rival Fiat 500C or DS3 Cabriolet. It's agreeable to find that the view out of the front of this drop top is just as good as in the hatch. Uh, when the hood's up like this, the pillarless design of the side windows helps too, compensating for woeful rear three-quarter vision caused by the broad rear quarter sections of the hood. Uh, Mini's design team has worked at increasing the size of the rear window, which is welcome, but it's still pretty difficult to see out of the back. Still, as I said earlier, the reversing camera helps with that, its picture registering on this central dash display. Ah yes, the central dash display. Now as ever in a modern Mini, it's still dinner plate sized, but these days doesn't house an almost indecipherable speedometer. That has been relocated to a pod above the steering wheel where it's flanked by a, a crescent moon rev counter. All of this has freed up this central area for much more infotainment trickery, marshaled via a 6.5 inch color display that in this case has been upgraded to a larger 8.8 inch screen in order to better show off the functionality of the extra cost media pack with its useful mini connected XL options. 
These build on the usual information, DAB stereo and Bluetooth phone functions by adding in 3D mapping for the optional navigation system, a jukebox and the various mini connected online services. Though crying out for touchscreen functionality, the color layouts are actually marshaled by this classy, effective iDrive style controller touchpad dial down by the handbrake. It's all very impressive, particularly if you make full use of the Mini Connected XL Systems downloadable JourneyMate app. This enables you to plan journeys on your smartphone, checking on the weather and setting reminders that can flash up on the central screen as you drive, along with information on local fuel stations, parking spaces and traffic reports. Another feature of this central display is the way that the LED perimeter lights around the edge progressively illuminate as you switch driving modes, engage the engine stop-start, cope with parking or count down to your next sat-nav turn-off. What else? Um, well, there are plenty of distinctive mini touches. Uh, the way the start-stop central toggle tab features a heartbeat illumination which pulses before the engine started probably won't bother you too much, but if you've paid extra for the mini driving mode system and twist the rather cheap feeling collar tab at the base of the gear stick to select the setup's sport mode, a graphic flashes up on the center screen showing a rocket and a go-kart. Worse, activate the vehicle and surroundings part of the rather cringily named driving excitement section of this central infotainment display and you get a series of tick list graphics that show things like missiles flying from the engine bay and the car itself wearing a giant pair of sunglasses. To be frank, it's all a bit naff. Still, there is, more importantly, a reasonable level of cabin storage. Tick the right option boxes and you get twin cup holders in front of a gear lever, a lidded cubby between the front seats and another cup holder behind that. The glove box offers limited space and the door bins aren't even big enough to hold a 500 milliliter bottle of water. Also on the driver's door are the electric window switches, including one that works all four at once. Let's take a seat in the back. Now, with the roof up like this, squeezing in isn't that easy. And it's pretty claustrophobic once you're inside. With the roof down, of course, things are very different. Well, obviously, it's easy to get in. And once in place back here, with the car in al fresco guide, you can better start to appreciate the extra space that's offered by this Mark III model. True, it is still hardly what you'd call spacious, but these things are relative. By class standards, this Mini is much improved in this regard thanks to the extra 28 millimeters of body length that's been added between the front and rear wheels, freeing up 36 millimeters more knee room. And that makes quite a difference. Whereas in previous mini convertibles, these pews were strictly for children only, they can now just about work for modestly sized adults on short journeys with a bit of cooperation from those up front. Carrying kids is no problem, thanks to Isofix child seat mounts for both of these seats, but you can only take two of your offspring. A rival DS3 Cabrio can, at a pinch, take three. Whoever's seated back here, they'll be a bit blown about at anything other than urban speeds. Uh, that goes with the territory when traveling in a full cabriolet of this kind. Buffeting of that sort can at least be reduced for um, front folk with an optional wind deflector that can be clicked in across these rear seats when you're not using them. The increase in body length hasn't only increased rear passenger space, there's more luggage room too. Uh, this boot is around 25% bigger than it was before, but don't get your hopes up too much with regards to what's available. Uh, with the roof down like this, the area is just 160 litres in size, although that's only a fraction less than is offered by a Fiat 500C and a lot more than you get from, say, a Mazda MX-5. When the roof's up, though, it makes quite a lot of difference. With the top raised, carriage capacity rises to a more acceptable 215 litres, and access to the space uh, provided is also easier thanks to these two levers. Pull them, and the upper section of the boot pops up to make 
loading larger bags or cases less of a puzzle. Whatever the hood positioning, uh, you can free up extra carriage room by pushing forward the 50-50 split folding rear backrests. So now's the time to find out how much this car costs and what you get for that money. Wind in the hair, convertible mini motoring demands a premium of around three and a half thousand pounds over the equivalent fixed top three door hatch model. From launch, the range started at Cooper level, which meant asking prices beginning from around £18,500. Add another £1,750 to that figure if you want the diesel frugality of the Cooper D version. If you want more speed, the two litre petrol derivatives beckon, either the Cooper S variant at around £22,500 or the potent John Cooper Works model we're trying here, priced at around £27,000. Across the range, there's the option of Steptronic paddle shift six-speed automatic transmission for just over £1,600 more, should you want it. On to the value proposition those figures deliver. Now, as ever, your perception of this will depend on your points of comparison. After all, it's not really fair to suggest that a comparably specified version of a car like Fiat's 500C would save you four to five thousand pounds over a Mini, given that the Italian car offers a lot less space and power, and it isn't really a proper convertible. Essentially, the 500 only comes with a giant fabric folding sunroof, and that's a setup also used by the Vauxhall Adam Rocks Air and the Citroen Drive DS3 Cabrio. Uh, the DS3 is a closer match to this Mini, comparable in size and power, and able to offer a model-for-model -model saving of between £1,500 and £2,500, depending on the variant you're looking at. It is an older design though, and as we said, it isn't really a proper open top. Uh, a better match to this Mini that is can be found with Volkswagen's second generation Beetle Cabriolet. Uh, here you get the same sort of retro appeal, four proper seats, a slightly larger boot and a fully convertible roof. However, the VW can only match this Mini on price if you opt for a variant with a feebler engine. If you pitch like with like, for example, a Beetle 1.4 TSI against a comparably performing Mini Cooper, uh, you'll find that the Volkswagen costs you an extra two and a half thousand pounds or over five thousand pounds more if you want a comparably performing diesel version. Are there other options? Well, possibly, but nothing that's really quite the same. Now, you could save yourself £5,000 or so and get yourself a Smart 4.2 Cabrio in preference, but that car's really tiny. Uh, Mazda's MX-5 could be had for similar money to this Mini, but that's a sports roadster, really a different kind of car, and it's really nothing like as practical. Otherwise, your options are really limited to much more expensive premium brand compact open top models like BMW's 2 Series convertible or Audi's A3 Cabriolet. Now for one of those, you're looking at paying in the £27,000 to £35,000 bracket. And when you've considered all of these rivals, we wouldn't be at all surprised if you decided the Mini convertible was the car for you. So you're going to need to know just what's included in that standard equipment tally. Let's start with the Cooper variant. Now outside, as well as the electrically operated fabric roof, you get 16 inch alloy wheels, front fog lights, a Thatcham category one alarm, and a choice of red, white, or yellow paint with the door mirror caps finished in the same body color. Uh, mindful of this model's limitations in rearward vision, Mini has fitted every convertible model with rear parking sensors and a reversing camera. And you'll be thankful to have both of those. Inside there's air conditioning, an onboard computer and an engine start button, plus a decent standard of entertainment with basic Bluetooth phone connectivity and a visual boost radio, including a DAB tuner. The 6.5 inch central color display you're used to access this also features the mini connected system that allows you to hook up your smartphone to the car and use your apps on the go. The screen also allows you to receive RSS news feeds and entertainment features such as Deezer, Napster and TuneIn. If you opt for the diesel engine Cooper D variant, you get the addition of satellite navigation as part of an upgraded connected XL system that also includes a clever journeymate function that gives you real-time traffic information. The connected XL setup on convertible models also includes a rain warner feature that uses a weather forecast to send the driver a message that it might be a good idea to close the roof when the car's parked up. 
And that same system can also alert the driver during a journey that rain is likely ahead and even suggest places to pull in to close the roof. As well as the connected XL system, Cooper D buyers also enjoy a few other extra niceties. Uh, things like a front armrest, a sport multifunction steering wheel, cruise control with a braking function and enhanced Bluetooth phone connectivity with USB audio. Uh, to this tally, the more potent Cooper S model adds sports seats and 16-inch alloy wheels and a more stylish loop design. At the top of the range, the John Cooper Works variant we're trying here has a package of extra aesthetic features, including an aerodynamic body kit and larger 17-inch alloys masking branded brake calipers. These two upper models also have twin rear exhausts in the centre of the lower bumper and clear indicator lenses to mark them out. When it comes to extra cost features, the preferred approach that most Mini customers tend to take is to buy into one of the provided packs that bundles key features more affordably together. Uh, take the Mini Tech Pack you may well want if you've opted for a basic coupe model that lacks the connected XL and satellite navigation features fitted elsewhere in the range. The Tech Pack gives you both of these things, along with a desirable upgraded Harman Kardon Hi-Fi system and a head-up display that projects information onto the windscreen to help keep your eyes on the road. You can also order that last feature separately if you want to. As for packs that will interest all mainstream Mini Convertible customers, well, the most popular will probably be the Pepper Pack. This comes with passenger seat height adjustment, uh, rain sensing wipers and automatic climate control from the air conditioning. It also includes the extended interior light package that illuminates the front footwells when you open the door. And the mini excitement pack which gives you sports instruments and a downloadable app that shows you engine output and torque along with a force meter that shows you the current g-forces at work on you and your passengers. Also the cringily named excitement analyzer that assesses the sportiness of your driving. There's also a neat feature that projects the brand logo onto the ground from the driver's door mirror for 20 seconds after you unlock the car after dark. Uh, this will be really quite a passenger talking point at night. Want to go further? Well, almost certainly then you'll need the chili pack. It comes with all the kit that Pepper people get while also adding sports front seats, LED headlights and perhaps most importantly, the mini driving mode system. Now with driving modes fitted, you can switch the car from its standard setup into sport, mid or green settings that'll tweak both throttle and the steering responses. If you've chosen to pay extra and uh, get the optional VDC variable damper control system, uh, your chosen driving mode setting will also set up the suspension to better suit your chosen mood. As for other optional features, well, of course, there are plenty. We'll begin with three features that we'd certainly want. First, the wind deflector that fits over the rear seats when the roof's down and reduces buffeting. Uh, second, seat heating. Uh, that'll be pretty important if you're going to be retracting the roof on bright winter days. Thirdly, we really think you should tick the box for run-flat tyres. These alleviate all the worry of getting a puncture and finding yourself stranded on the side of the road fiddling with a tyre repair kit which is all that's provided as standard for that kind of emergency. Uh, you could alternatively pay extra for a space saver spare wheel, but you don't really want to do that as it'll eat up space in that already tiny boot. Other options aren't quite as crucial. Uh, we were talking about media and infotainment earlier. A Media XL pack allows you to upgrade the central infotainment screen from 6.5 to 8.8 .8 inches in size. Uh, frequent motorway travel will be eased by active cruise control that uses a radar to keep you a safe, constant distance behind the car in front. Town dwellers, meanwhile, will want the park assist system that will help you identify tight spaces and then automatically steer you into them. Other features you might like to consider include door mirrors that are auto dimming and power folding and the always open timer that will tell you for how long the convertible top has been open. Uh, you could also look at an upgraded Harman Kardon Hi-Fi system, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror, a heated front windscreen, adaptive LED headlamps that turn with the bends, uh, auto headlamps and wipers, and the option of LED front fog lights. 
Enthusiastic drivers, meanwhile, will like the idea of the cockpit chrono package, which gives you three extra dials behind the steering wheel, covering turbo boost pressure, oil pressure and stopwatch. Buyers of that sort will also want to look at the stiffer sport suspension and the performance control torque vectoring system that's standard on top Cooper S and John Cooper Works models. Uh, when cornering quickly at speed, this manages torque delivery through the front wheels, prioritising power to the wheel with the most traction and so aiding quicker forward momentum. Uh, we should also talk about a few of the practically orientated options. Uh, these include bike rack preparation, comfort access keyless entry and a storage compartment pack uh, that gives you cup holders, a luggage area 12 volt socket, a storage net in the front passenger footwell and two more useful nets in the boot. The extended storage pack includes these items and also adds a storage pocket in the back of the front seat. The other available extra cost features tend to be aesthetic ones. Now this is where Mini comes into its own, as you can personalise this car to a degree almost unrivaled in any sector. For this third generation convertible, Mini has introduced a soft top roof with a union jack design woven into the fabric. Uh, you can choose from nine different metallic paint colours and there are various single and twin stripe options to further customise the exterior. You can also pick different finishes for the door mirror covers, including the popular Union Jack or checkered flag styles. Lesser mini convertibles can add this top model's John Cooper Works aerodynamic body kit, offered as one of the items bundled up in the John Cooper Works chili pack. As an alternative, there's a subtler chrome line exterior trim. As for the wheels, there are multiple different types and you can upgrade them to 17 or 18 inch rims if you really don't mind ruining the ride. Now you can uh, spend just as much time choosing options for the interior of this Mini. What about an upgraded Mini Yours Soda Sport leather trim steering wheel? Or perhaps on a humbler Mini convertible, you'd like that wheel and the top John Cooper Works Sport form that's fitted to this most expensive variant. Uh, you might want upgraded velour floor mats or special chrome line cabin trim. And for the seats, you can mix cloth and leather or go for full leather upholstery in a choice of five different shades with coloured trim inserts if you want them. Now, what about safety equipment? Well, as you'd expect, this model's fundamental design is pretty much as safety conscious as a car of this kind can be. Should an impending rollover be detected, high strength aluminium hoops will pop up from behind the rear seats in just 150 milliseconds. These combine with a strengthened windscreen frame to create a passenger survival space. Otherwise, safety provision is pretty much as you'd find it in any other Mini. It is a bit disappointing to find that you have to pay extra for things like a warning triangle, a first aid kit and a car jack, but otherwise most of what you'd expect to find is included. And that means twin front and side airbags to protect the occupants in the front, while ice-fix child seat mounts are fitted on a back seat that you'll need to remember can only safely take two people. There are anti-lock brakes, of course, with electronic brake force distribution to make them more effective and cornering brake control to help you through the turns. So you're always primed for a swift stop. There's fading brake support and a clever brake drying function that will imperceptibly dap the discs in wet weather to keep them dry. There's also the usual stability control system and a DTC dynamic traction control setup that in poor conditions allows a bit of controlled slip at the drive wheels. So moving away on loose sand or deep snow can be a little smoother. There's also a tire pressure monitoring system and a pedestrian friendly bonnet. If you want to go further, then you'll want to pay more for the driving assist option. Now this pack is based around a camera operated cruise control and distance control function that's there to automatically maintain a predetermined distance for the vehicle ahead. It'll also dip your high beam for you at night and display road signs on the dash as you pass them. Uh, best of all, a clever collision and pedestrian warning system is included that scans the road ahead for potential accident hazards. If one's detected, then you'll be warned. Now, if you don't respond, or perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Another smart idea is the optional mini emergency call system. 
In the event of an accident, this setup automatically detects vehicle location and accident severity before contacting a call center to initiate fast and effective assistance. And that could well be a lifesaver. Mini has cut fuel consumption by as much as 25% with this third generation convertible in comparison to the previous model. That's the kind of significant step forward you would expect following a series of important changes that have taken place beneath the bonnet. Like many other brands, Mini has switched to a more efficient all turbo powered engine range and the twin power turbo motors have direct fuel injection and variable valve timing so that they meet the tough Euro 6 emission standard. More significant though is the adoption of much lighter downsized three cylinder 1.5 litre technology for the mainstream Cooper petrol and diesel models. We'll start with this for predictably that's where the running cost headlines are with this Mark III model lineup. Go for the baseline petrol Cooper with manual transmission and you're looking at 57.6 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and carbon dioxide emissions of 118 grams per kilometre. Opt for the Cooper D diesel and your readings will improve to 74.3 miles per gallon and 100 grams per kilometre of CO2. And in either case, if you choose the Steptronic Auto gearbox, your returns will fall by around 5%. These figures can't compare with a smaller, lighter, more feebly powered compact convertible like a Fiat 500C, but they're far better than you get with something more directly competitive like comparably powered versions of Volkswagen's Beetle Cabriolet. Uh, if you want a comparison with a conventional fixed top mini hatch using the same engine, then think in terms of this convertible version going about five fewer miles on every gallon and putting somewhere between eight and 12 grams per kilometer more of CO2 out into the atmosphere. That's not bad given this drop top model's extra weight and slightly less slippery aerodynamics. So far, so good then, but just how economical can this convertible model be with a great big two litre engine installed up front, as is the case with the petrol powered Cooper S and JCW John Cooper Works performance variants for the top of the range? Well, still reasonably efficient is the answer, assuming you resist the temptation to continually use all that performance on offer. In a Cooper S convertible, you'll manage 46.3 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 139 grams per kilometre of CO2. Uh, go for this top JCW, John Cooper Works version, and the figures are 43.5 miles per gallon and 152 grams per kilometre. With these two litre variants, these readings can actually be enhanced by the addition of automatic transmission, the returns improving by around 5%. Hence the way that the automatic JCW model we're trying here can manage 47.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 138 grams per kilometre of CO2. That's not bad for a 213 brake horsepower convertible hot hatch. So, how has Mini done it? Well, apart from pushing forward with its powertrain development, uh, the brand also relies heavily on its usual minimalism technologies. Uh, things like brake energy regeneration, active cooling air flaps, the reduction of engine and transmission internal frictional losses, and ancillary engine systems that operate only when they're called upon, rather than constantly pumping away in the background. Electric power steering helps as well, and underneath the car, there's extensive panelling, just like a Formula One racer, enabling this Mini to slip through the air with as little resistance as possible. Plus, of course, there's a stop-start system to cut the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Uh, automatic models can also work with the Mini navigation system to take account of your selected route and better control your gear shift to suit. And the Steptronic variants get a so-called coasting function, where at high cruising speeds, the drivetrain is temporarily decoupled for extra frugality when you come off the accelerator. Of course, the driver needs to play his or her part too. Uh, there's a shift point display so you can optimally time your gear changes. Plus, there are various extra cost systems you can add that should further help to drive your running costs down. First up is the mini driving mode setup that we have here. It operates via use of this rotary switch at the base of the gear stick, allowing you to switch from a default mid mode to self-explanatory sport or green settings. Uh, green mode uh, modifies the throttle and transmission response and tweaks that gear shift point display. 
The onboard computer provides two readouts which demonstrate the effect of the fuel savings all this creates. One that shows the extra mileage available and another that shows the reduced energy consumption. Finally, there's the minimalism analyzer available as part of the mini connected media package there to score your driving and guide you towards more economic progress. It might initially seem to be a bit of a gimmick, but owners who've used it reckon on the fuel economy improvements of between four and eight miles per gallon. What else? Um, maintenance. Well, the need for that will vary according to use, but you can reckon on uh, around 12,000 miles before a dealer bid is needed. Uh, you can pay for each service individually, but almost all mini customers opt for the firm's TLC prepaid servicing package. This covers the first five years or 50,000 miles of use, which ever comes sooner. Uh, you can further extend this with the TLC XL option that takes this to eight years or 80,000 miles. Now, should you sell the car before the end of the TLC term, then the balance goes with the car to the next owner. Uh, you're also covered by a three-year unlimited mileage warranty. Uh, after that, there's a mini insured warranty program which covers cars that have completed under 100,000 miles. As you'd expect, you'll pay more to insure this fabric top mini than you'd have to find for its fixed top hatch equivalent. Insurance groupings for mainstream mini convertible models run from group 16 to 29, higher in other words than with a rival DS3 Cabrio or Fiat 500C. The Cooper D variant comes in at Group 16, while the Petrol Cooper model is rated at Group 19. The Petrol Cooper S can nudge up into Group 29, though that can fall to Group 25 if you specify the auto gearbox. On the plus side, at the end of your time with this car, you'll see a greater proportion of its value back than would be the case uh, with most key competitors. You can expect a mini convertible to retain 40% of its new price after three years and 60,000 miles. To give you some perspective on that, a rival DS3 Cabrio achieves 31%, while a Fiat 500C will hang on to just 30% of its value. Uh, one note of caution here though, these figures are heavily affected by the spec you choose. Load your car up with too many extras and its residuals can be severely affected. Specify too few and the same can happen. Uh, restrict yourself to the chili or tech packs and the residual figures we've quoted should be eminently achievable. So this Mini looks great, it's brilliantly designed, cheap to run and holds its value. It's even a bit more practical than you might be expecting. Okay, you could perhaps complain about the premium pricing, but in truth, there's not really much more than that to put off would-be convertible purchasers who need a more involving drive than one of those hairdressers cabriolets, but who don't want a sports roadster either. Making the third generation version of this open top mini slightly larger may have moved it a little further away from the size and scale of other models, but this remains very much a small convertible for the modern age. Vitally, it still feels like a small car, thanks to alert steering, agile handling, better all-round visibility and peppy engines offer a decent blend of performance and economy. Are there downsides? Uh, well, I mentioned pricing. At first glance, the figures quoted can seem higher than those you'll pay for some apparently direct rivals. Take a close look at cheaper competitors though, and you'll find that in some respects, they aren't really direct rivals, just hatch models with very large retracting fabric sunroofs. Now, if that's what you want, then fine. But if you're after the most affordable full convertible on the market, a car to really get the wind rustling through your hair, then this is it. True, the overall asking price won't be cheap once you've added a few must-have extras, but console yourself with the realization that residuals are easily the strongest in the class, so you'll get much of that money back at resale time. In summary, we've a mini convertible that's matured a little, but still knows how to have fun. Yes, some of the extra features, things like the rain warner and the always open timer can seem a little gimmicky, but they're fun. And isn't that the point of a car like this? If for you it is, then perhaps, just perhaps, another mini adventure beckons.